Hey guys, what's up? Aru, the old world. I never thought that I'd revisit a scuffed video this soon. But yeah, welcome to another video of someone who can't let go of the past. This video is gonna be about everything I can find and more or less summarize regarding the old world. And when I say old, I mean really old. We'll go over as much of each era throughout Tevat's timeline, some notable kingdoms that rose and fell in those eras, the different ways they ruled in their time, some things they did, or details and events worth noting from their rule. For now, this will be about the Dragon Lords, the Primordial One, and the Seelie Era. I'll do a continuation with the God Kings, the Archons, and the Archon War, as well as the Cataclysms events and post. As always, timestamps below. But before we start, big thanks to our first sponsor, Genshin Star. If you're looking for awesome Genshin merch, then this is the place for you. Genshin Star is an official fan-made merchandise store with copyright permission from Genshin Impact itself. They've got nearly everything a Genshin player would ever want. Clothing, mouse pads, light boxes, visions, 3D mouse pads, and many other trinkets. My favorite is the elemental monument so I don't have to solve any more puzzles. Thank the Archons. They ship worldwide and have full refunds if you don't receive your item. So come over to Genshin Star and use the coupon code J525 for 10% off on your orders. Thanks again to Genshin Star. Now on with the video. Over 6,000 years ago, predating the birth of the oldest character we know, Song Li, Tevat was ruled by the seven sovereign dragon lords. All seven lords each belonged and ruled their own separate nation, and fashioned it to their design. This era we can maybe call the Old World, but I want to call it the Era of Dragons, or the Dragon Era, so I don't get confused with which Old World we're referring to. These dragon lords were elemental beings, not from Tevat. They come from what is known as the Elemental Realm, the Vishap Realm, or the the Light Realm, a place that hosts creatures that harness the pure, raw, primordial elements. And the Dragon Lords are the peak of elemental power. As pure elementals, they could age longer than any other being and ruled over seven nations in their time. This ended once another lord from beyond the heavens came, but we'll talk about that later. The only original dragon lord that we have seen is the dendro dragon Apep, who once ruled the land of Sumeru. The traveler described Apep's children metaphorically, like small dendro slimes generated from larger dendro slimes. And the weenat, as well as the fungi, are some of the few we have seen of Apep's children. The other dragon lord that we haven't seen yet is the dragon king, Nibelung, who fought and lost against a usurper from beyond, but then fought again with a new power, Forbidden Knowledge. Nibelung led the other dragons, including Apep, to fight against the usurper once more with this new power, which ended with Nibelung's death and the end of the dragon era. We also have the Dragon of Water, who is rumored to rise up again as a human or the dragon who weeps when it rains in Fontaine. Legends of the Remurian Empire of Fontaine mention a king of the seaborn dragons named Scylla, who led a horde of vishaps and barbarians against them. Scylla's power was said to be sealed, but not mentioned to have died. So this dragon Scylla might still be underneath Fontaine's ruins somewhere. But whether or not Scylla is the same as Nibelung, we can't say. Maybe humans simply called Scylla a king of the seaborn dragons, relating to the dragon of water. But the dragon lords know them as I belong. Other than that, we can't really find any distinct features left by their rule apart from the creatures, terrain, domains, and the environment that they changed with their presence. Similar to Vishaps like Ejdaha or the Bathysmal Vishaps, and in some cases, Orobashi and Duvalin and other quote-unquote dragons, whose mere presence and power shapes the area around them, and even in death, they still pose a visible difference in environment as well as a prominent threat to those less cautious. For the sake of context, I've separated the era of Seelie and the Primordial One's era because some of the events took place in each of the era's narratives separately, but similar events from both eras do line up with each other, especially with Sumeru and Fontaine. So starting with the Primordial Era, which was ruled by the usurper of the Era of Dragons. The primordial one who was said to be Fanes came to Tevat and fought with the Dragon Lords in a war for about quote unquote 40 years. After defeating the Dragon Lords, the primordial one created four shades of itself. Specifically, it states that the primordial one and one of the four shades created Tevat and its creatures. Humanity was also created by the primordial one and that one shade. The other shades, we don't know yet what they were doing. But humans would be constantly blessed by the heavens. 
At this time, humanity made a covenant or promise to the Primordial One, and in turn, a very prosperous, peaceful time was given to humanity. The one taboo that the Primordial One gave to the people was to succumb to temptation. This was their promise. But humanity's path to temptation was already sealed, and so was their fate. At some point, the second throne of the heavens came and another heavenly war began. Lands were plunged beneath the seas, the heavens collapsed, and the earth was rent asunder, almost destroying it completely. One of the lands that sank was Byako Yakoku, or the Eternal Country, which we now know as Enkanomiya, or the palace below the depths. This land ended up disconnected from Tevet's border, in a place where ghosts of fallen gods and destroyed lands of angels once was. Possibly Possibly the Dark Sea. They would face numerous trials against the Hydro Bishops who already fled there after the fall of the Dragon Era. They prayed for help, but their god never answered. Through the help of only one of the Shades, named Easteroth, and a certain sage named Abrax, they were able to fend off this threat with a huge Tower of Light, the Helios. But it wasn't long before humanity again showed its fangs and betrayed even itself. Which is reflected upon the Sun Children's sad fate as young sacrifices to the Helios orchestrated by the old and wicked elders of that time. After an unknown number of years, a child of Enkanomiya found the Orobashi and worshipped it as their god. Later, they were brought to the surface through the Orobashi but so much time had passed already. Tevat was ruled by the heavenly principles, and the continent was divided into seven nations again, but this time ruled by Archons. In their records, it states six years, but when they came back, about 5,000 to 6,000 years had passed on the surface. These unknown number of years after the first six years were not recorded, sadly, because the only one who was recording it either died or was killed. Orobashi would have likely survived if not for a forbidden book. This book had within it the past that the Primordial One ruled and the history that era had with humanity's temptation and the coming of the Second Heavenly Throne. Orobashi then had to sacrifice itself for knowing the past of Byako Yakoku. This book of records is known as Before the Sun and Moon. At the time of recording, Enkanomiya, the Chasm, and some ruins in Sumeru and Fontaine possess the same architecture characteristics. But we can still see ruins that are usually referred to as the unified civilization scattered throughout Tevat. Let's move on to the era of divine envoys. Some say that the first era was flooded by the heavens because humans desired more than what was promised, while some believe that a time existed where divine envoys did not intervene. So which is the first era and which is the era with no divine envoys? The Sili were a very wise and beautiful race that guided mankind. Their old forms existed before the birth of Morax and still existed for a short time while he was still young. The Sili taught humanity languages and philosophies of nature. Folktales even speak of the Sili having a place for themselves separate from the continent of Tevat, where they would sing songs with their lutes in their grand halls of angels. This guidance of the Sili for the humans would in turn lead to prosperity for countless generations, until the ancestor of the Sili met with a traveler from afar. The ancestor of the Sili and this traveler would create a unified oath witnessed by the three moon sisters of the the lunar palace. Just 30 years, quote unquote 30 years, after their marriage, a disaster struck the world. Afterwards, the two lovers were exiled or fled in exile, but would still fall to their eventual doom, punished with memory loss and be separated from each other for eternity. Both the Sili and the three sisters would then slowly wither away and leave fragments of themselves in the mountains and ruins until their ultimate fate. Tales speak of an ashen-haired maiden, likely the first Sili, singing the song of the Sili, in a barren wasteland separate from Tevat and the reach of deities. It was once a song for the humans, but now it's a reminder of their fate. There are also historical records of the First Era, a time when envoys of the Heavenly City walked with humanity and guided them in their fruition and heaven-blessed lives. But humans, with their desire and greed, wanted things not promised to them by the heavens and tried to break free from their fate. In their rage, the heavens sent gigantic waves and a hundred days of rain into the settlers' cities, ending the early peoples of that time. 
A lone survivor of the fallen envoys also speak of the same era, but in her narrative, there were invaders from beyond the firmament who spread plagues and destruction. The master of the heavens brought down divine nails to mend the land out of fear of it spreading. Their race then suffered exile and was stripped of their connection to the heavens where they dwelled and their power of enlightenment or knowledge that they once taught to the humans. This was followed by a firm warning from the surviving envoy, not to seek the master and the four shades, and not to inquire the mysteries of the sky and abyss. A sort of separate event happened in the once lush land of Salvindagnir, inhabited by people who fled from snow and strife, highlighting the knowledge of that era from a civilization that received blessings from the white silver tree and a princess born under that white silver tree that foresaw the future, or maybe even the past, of not only Salvind, but all of Tevat through her paintings. Now, I can't exactly pinpoint which time this happened, since snow and strife in Mondstadt means Andreas and the Caribbean's Frost Wind War. But the Divine Envoy era happened before the Era of Kings. The reason Salvind is here instead of somewhere after the Archon War is because of the Mural Room, where the drawing of a horned entity giving what seems to be a gift to humans is located. If this horned entity is an envoy of the heavens, then it could mean that this is a Seelie, which fits the Goddess of Flowers' description of having thorns, since the Goddess of Flowers is speculated to be the Seelie who survived. But this could also be the primordial one when the first promise was made. Now that we've discussed the first three eras, let's move into the theory side of the video. The weird thing here is that lore bits from artifacts as well as lore books all tell different but similar stories of the same but different time. Like Enkonomiya, for some reason, having Seelie and the Moon Sisters. And why the Seelie era existed at the time when the second one came, when before the Sun and Moon never mentioned Seelie or Envoys in their time, well, apart from the Four Shades. And there's also Remoria mentioning the first era having Envoys voice in Tevat and guiding humans when the actual first era of the humans was the primordial ones, right after the dragons. This gap in history is likely just Hoyo not letting up the full history of Tevat, as they should. But if you ask me, I think it's something to do with history changing through the Erminsol and the ancestor of the Seelie's punishment. Nahira mentions another user of the Erminsol apart from herself. And the surviving Seelie doesn't know that her own ancestor swore an oath with a traveler from afar, likely the second one. Since Seelies don't have memories of their past. Unless this Seelie, the goddess of flowers, remembered the actual past that happened. There's also the allegorical tales that tell one story and mean something else, which hides a true story that was changed by the Erminsol. So whatever specific details happened between the Primordial One's time and the Era of Divine Envoys, and maybe even past that going into the Era of Kings like King Deshret, Remus, and the Caribbean, hopefully we'll know in due time once Hoyo releases more lore in the future. And there we go, the first three eras of Genshin Impact's history, along with my thoughts at the end. Again, huge thanks to Genshin Star for sponsoring this video. If you enjoyed, do leave a like, subscribe, and hit the bell for more content on this channel. Of course, you're all welcome to comment below your perspective of Tevat's history and which events belong to what time. It's really interesting that there's some discrepancies with how history is written in different regions, along with their own twists passed down through legends and folktales. That and allegories from folktales itself is a mess of mixed up history already. And that's not including the most allegorical tales like The Pale Princess or Vera's Melancholy. But that's it from me. I'll be uploading the next segment of this series which focuses on the Era of Kings and the Cataclysm, so be sure to wait for that. For now, I'll see you guys in the next video, yeah? Like, comment if you enjoyed, subscribe, and hit the bell for more of my ramblings, and stay mad theorists. Bye!